Yuan Shikai was a Chinese general, politician and emperor, famous for his influence during the late Qing dynasty, his role in the events leading up to the abdication of the last Qing emperor, his autocratic rule as the first formal president of the Republic of China, and his short-lived attempt to restore monarchy in China, with himself as the Hunxian emperor. Biography equals Early life equals Yuan Shikai was born in the village of Zanying, Xiankeng County, Chenzhe Prefecture, Henan, though the clan later moved 16 kilometers southeast of Xiankeng to a hilly area that was easier to defend. There the Yuans had built a fortified village, Yuan's Haikan. Yuan's family was affluent enough to provide Yuan with a traditional Confucian education. As a young man he enjoyed riding, boxing, and entertainment with friends. Though hoping to pursue a career in the civil service, he failed the imperial examinations twice, leading him to decide on an entry into politics through the Hiai Army, where many of his relatives served. His career began with the purchase of a minor official title in 1880, which was a common method of official promotion in the late Qing. Using his father's connections, Yuan traveled to Tinzhou, Shandong, and sought a post in the Qing Brigade. Yuan's first marriage was in 1876 to a woman of the Yu family who bore him a first son, Kedding, in 1878. Yuan Shikai married nine further concubines throughout the course of his life. Equals years in Joseon dynasty career equals, Joseon dynasty career in the early 1870s was in the midst of a struggle between isolationists under King Gajong's father, and progressives, led by the Queen, who wanted to open trade. After the Meiji Restoration, Japan had adopted an aggressive foreign policy, contesting Chinese domination of the peninsula. Under the unequal Treaty of Ganghua, which the Koreans signed with reluctance in 1876, Japan was allowed to send diplomatic missions to Hanzong, and open trading posts in Incheon and Wonsan. Amidst an internal power struggle which resulted in the Queen's exile, the Viceroy of Tsili, Leongzhang, sent the 3,000-strong Qing brigade into Korea. The Korean king proposed training 500 troops in the art of modern warfare, and Yuan Shikai was appointed to lead this task in Korea. Leongzhang also recommended Yuan's promotion, with Yuan given the rank of sub-prefect. In 1885, Yuan was appointed imperial resident of Seoul. On the surface the position equaled that of ambassador but in practice, as head official from the suzerain, Yuan had become the supreme advisor on all Korean government policies. Seeing China's increasing control of the Korean government, Japan sought more influence through co-suzerainty with China. A series of documents were released to Yuan Shikai, claiming the Korean government had changed its stance towards Chinese protection and was interested in Russian protection. Yuan was outraged yet skeptical, and asked Leon Xhang for advice. In a treaty signed between Japan and Qing, the two parties agreed only to send troops into Korea after notifying the other. Although the Korean government was now stable, it was still a protectorate of Qing. Koreans emerged advocating modernization. Another more radicalized group, the Dongok Society, promoting an early nationalist doctrine based partly upon Confucian principles, rose in rebellion against the government. Yuan and Leong Xhang sent troops into Korea to protect Seoul and Qing's interests, and Japan did the same under the pretext of protecting Japanese trading posts. Tensions boiled over between Japan and China when Japan refused to withdraw its forces and placed a blockade at the 38th parallel. Leong Xhang wanted at all costs to avoid a war with Japan, and attempted this by asking for international pressure for a Japanese withdrawal. Japan refused and war broke out. Yuan, having been put in an ineffective position, was recalled to Tianjin in July 1894, before the official outbreak of the First Sino-Japanese War. Equals Late Qing Dynasty equals, Yuan's rise to fame began with his nominal participation in the First Sino-Japanese War as commander of the Chinese garrison forces in Korea. And like other officers, however, he avoided the humiliation of Chinese defeat by having been recalled to Beijing several days before the outbreak of conflict. As an ally of Leong Xhang, Yuan was appointed the commander of the First New Army in 1895. 
as the officer most directly responsible for training China's first modernized army, Yuan gained significant political influence and the loyalty of a nucleus of young officers. By 1901, five of China's seven divisional commanders and most other senior military officers in China were his proto copyright Gar Copyright S. The Qing court relied heavily on his army due to the proximity of its garrison to the capital and their effectiveness. Of the new armies that formed part of the self strengthening movement, Yuan's was the best trained and most effective. The Qing court at the time was divided between progressives under the leadership of the Gangs Emperor, and conservatives under the Empress Daozhu Shixi, who had temporarily retreated to the Summer Palace as a place of retirement. After the Gangs Emperor's Hundred Days Reform in 1898, however, Shixi decided that the reforms were too drastic, and plotted to restore her own regency through a coup d'etat copyright tat. Plans of the coup spread early and the emperor was very aware of the plot. He asked reform advocates Kang Yuwei, Tan Sai Tung and others to develop a plan to save him. Yuan's involvement in the coup remains a matter of debate among historians. Tan Sai Tung reportedly spoke with Yuan several days before the coup, asking Yuan to assist the emperor against Shixi. Yuan refused a direct answer, but insisted he was loyal to the emperor. Meanwhile, Manchu General Ron Blu was planning maneuvers for his army to stage the coup. According to sources, including the diary of Liang Kuchao and contemporary Chinese news sources, Yuan Shikai arrived in Tianjin on September 20, 1898 by train. It was certain that by the evening, Yuan had talked to Ron Blu, but what was revealed to him remains ambiguous. Most historians suggest that Yuan had told Ron Blu of all details of the reformers' plans, and asked him to take immediate action. The plot being exposed, Ron Blue's troops entered the Forbidden City at dawn on September 21, forcing the emperor into seclusion in a lake palace. Making a political alliance with the Empress Daozhu, and becoming a lasting enemy of the Gangs Emperor, Yuan left the capital in 1899 for his new appointment as governor of Shandong. During his three-year tenure the Boxer Rebellion erupted. Yuan ensured the suppression of boxers in the province, though his troops took no active part outside Shandong itself. Yuan took the side of the pro-foreign faction in the imperial court, along with Prince Qing, Liangxiang, and Ron Blu. He refused to side with the boxers and attack the Eight Nation Alliance forces, joining with other Chinese governors who commanded substantial modernized armies like Zhang Zedong not participating in the Boxer Rebellion. He and Zhang ignored Empress Daozhu Shixi's declaration of war against the foreign powers and continued to suppress the boxers. In addition to not fighting the Eighth Nation Alliance and suppressing the boxers in Shandong, Yuan and his army also helped the Eighth Nation Alliance suppress the boxers after the alliance captured Beijing in August 1900. Yuan Shikai's forces massacred tens of thousands of people in their anti-boxer campaign in Tsili. Yuan operated out of Beijing during the campaign, which ended in 1902. He also founded a provincial junior college in Jinan, which adopted Western ideas of education. In June 1902 he was promoted to Viceroy of Tsili, the lucrative commissioner for North China trade, and minister of Biyang, comprising the modern regions of Liaoning, Hebei, and Shandong. Having gained the regard of foreigners after helping crush the Boxer Rebellion, he successfully obtained numerous loans to expand his Biyang army into the most powerful army in China. He created a 2,000-strong police force to keep order in Tianjin, the first of its kind in Chinese history, as a result of the Boxer Protocol having forbidden troops to be staged close to Tianjin. Yuan was also involved in the transfer of railway control from Shengxu and Hui, leading railways and their construction to become a large source of his revenue. Yuan played an active role in late Qing political reforms, including the creation of the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Police. He further advocated ethnic equality between Manchus and Han Chinese. In 1905, acting on Yuan's advice, Daozhu Empress Shixi issued a decree ending the traditional Confucian examination system in 1906. 
she and ordered the Ministry of Education to implement a system of primary and secondary schools and universities with state-mandated curriculum, modelled after the educational system of Meiji period Japan. On August 27, 1908, the QING court promulgated principles for a constitution, which Yuan helped to draft. This document called for a constitutional government with a strong monarchy, with a constitution to be issued by 1916 and an elected parliament by 1917. Yuan Shikai's hand-dominated new army was primarily responsible for the defense of Beijing, as most of the modernized Eight Banner divisions were destroyed in the Boxer Rebellion and the new modernized Banner forces were token in nature. Equals retreat and return equals, the Empress Daijia and the Gangs Emperor died within a day of each other in November 1908. Sources indicate that the will of the Emperor specifically ordered Yuan's execution. But nonetheless he avoided death. In January 1909 Yuan Shikai was relieved of all his posts by the regent, Prince Chun. The public reason for Yuan's resignation was that he was returning to his home in the village of Huanchang, now the prefecture-level city of Anyang, due to a foot disease. During his three years of effective exile, Yuan kept contact with his close allies, including Duan Karui, who reported to him regularly about army proceedings. The loyalty of the Baiyang army was still undoubtedly behind him. Having this strategic military support, Yuan held the balance of power between various revolutionaries and the QING court. Both wanted Yuan on their side. Equals the Wei Kang Uprising and the Republic equals, the Wei Kang Uprising took place on October 10, 1911 in Hubei Province. The southern provinces subsequently declared their independence from the QING court, but neither the northern provinces nor the Baiyang army had a clear stance for or against the rebellion. Both the QING court and Yuan were fully aware that the Baiyang army was the only QING force powerful enough to quell the revolutionaries. The court requested Yuan's return on October 27, but he repeatedly declined offers from the QING court for his return, first as the viceroy of Huquang, and then as prime minister of the imperial cabinet. Time was on Yuan's side, and Yuan waited, using his foot ailment as a pretext to his continual refusal. After further pleas by the QING court, Yuan agreed and eventually left his village for Beijing on October 30, becoming Prime Minister on November 1, 1911. Immediately after that he asked the regent to withdraw from politics, which forced Zaifeng to resign as regent. This made way for Yuan to form a new, predominantly Han Chinese, cabinet of confidence, with only one Manchu as Minister of Suzerainty. To further award Yuan's loyalty to the court, the Empress Dai Jilongwu offered Yuan the noble title Marquis of the First Rank, an honor only previously given to 19th century General Zhang Gofen for his raising of the Xiang army to suppress the Taiping Rebellion. Meanwhile, in the Battle of Yangtze, Yuan's forces recaptured Hanko and Hainiang from the revolutionaries. Yuan knew that complete suppression of the revolution would end his usefulness to the QING regime. Instead of attacking Wei Kang, he began to negotiate with the revolutionaries. Abdication of the Child Emperor The revolutionaries had elected Sun Yat-sen as the first provisional president of the Republic of China, but they were in a weak position militarily, so they negotiated with the QING, using Yuan as an intermediary. Yuan arranged for the abdication of the Child Emperor Pu Yi in return for being granted the position of president of the Republic of China. Yuan was not present when the abdication edict was issued by Empress Da Jilongwu on February 12, 1912. Sun agreed to Yuan's presidency after some internal bickering, but asked that the capital be situated in Nanjing. Yuan, however, wanted the geographic advantage of having the nation's capital close to his base of military power. Cao Kan, one of his trusted subordinate Baiyang military commanders, fabricated a coup d'etat copyright tat in Beijing and Tianjin, apparently under Yuan's orders, to provide an excuse for Yuan not to leave his sphere of influence in Sili. The revolutionaries compromised again, and the capital of the new republic was established in Beijing. Yuan Shikai was elected provisional president of the Republic of China by the Nanjing Provisional Senate on February 14, 1912, and sworn in on March 10 of that year. Democratic elections, 
In February 1913, democratic elections were held for the National Assembly in which the Kuomintang scored a significant victory. Song Jioran of the KMT zealously supported a cabinet system and was widely regarded as a candidate for prime minister. One of Song's main political goals was to ensure that the powers and independence of China's parliament be properly protected from the influence of the office of the president. Song's goals in curtailing the office of the president conflicted with the interests of Yuan, who, by mid-1912, clearly dominated the provisional cabinet and was showing signs of a desire to hold overwhelming executive power. During Song's travels through China in 1912, he had openly and vehemently expressed the desire to limit the powers of the president in terms that often appeared openly critical of Yuan's ambitions. When the results of the 1913 elections indicated a clear victory for the KMT, it appeared that Song would be in a position to exercise a dominant role in selecting the premier and cabinet, and the party could have proceeded to push for the election of a future president in a parliamentary setting. On March 20, 1913, while traveling to Beijing, Song Jioran was shot by a lone gunman in Shanghai, and died two days later. The trail of evidence led to the Secretary of the Cabinet and the Provisional Premier of Yuan's government. Although Yuan was considered by contemporary Chinese media sources as the man most likely behind the assassination, the main conspirators investigated by authorities were either themselves assassinated or disappeared mysteriously. For lack of evidence, Yuan was never officially implicated. Equals becoming emperor equals. Tensions between the KMT and Yuan continued to intensify. After arriving in Peking, the elected parliament attempted to gain control over Yuan, to develop a permanent constitution, and to hold a legitimate, open presidential election. Because he had authorized $100 million of reorganization loans from a variety of foreign banks, the KMT in particular were highly critical of Yuan's handling of the national budget. Yuan's crackdown on the KMT began in 1913, with the suppression and bribery of KMT members in the two legislative chambers. Anti-Yuan revolutionaries also claimed Yuan orchestrated the collapse of the KMT internally and dismissed governors interpreted as being pro-KMT. Second Revolution, seeing the situation for his party worsen, Sun Yat-sen fled to Japan in November 1913, and called for a second revolution, this time against Yuan Shikai. Subsequently, Yuan gradually took over the government, using the military as the base of his power. He dissolved the national and provincial assemblies, and the House of Representatives and Senate were replaced by the newly formed Council of State, with Duan Karui, his trusted Biyang lieutenant, as prime minister. He relied on the American-educated Tsai Ting Khan for English translation and connections with Western powers. Finally, Yuan had himself elected president to a five-year term, publicly labeled the KMT a seditious organization, ordered the KMT's dissolution, and evicted all its members from parliament. The KMT's second revolution ended in failure as Yuan's troops achieved complete victory over revolutionary uprisings. Provincial governors with KMT loyalties who remained willingly submitted to Yuan. Because those commanders not loyal to Yuan were effectively removed from power, the Second Revolution cemented Yuan's power. In January 1914, China's parliament was formally dissolved. To give his government a semblance of legitimacy, Yuan convened a body of 66 men from his cabinet who, on May 1, 1914, produced a constitutional compact that effectively replaced China's provisional constitution. The new legal status quo gave Yuan, as president, practically unlimited powers over China's military, finances, foreign policy, and the rights of China's citizens. Yuan justified these reforms by stating that representative democracy had been proven inefficient by political infighting. After his victory, Yuan reorganized the provincial governments. Each province was now supported by a military governor as well as a civil authority, giving each governor control of their own army. This helped lay the foundations for the warlordism that crippled China over the next two decades. During Yuan's presidency, a silver dollar carrying his portrait was introduced. This coin type was the first dollar coin of the central authorities of the Republic of China to be minted in significant quantities. 
it became a staple silver coin type during the first half of the 20th century and was struck for the last time as late as the 1950s. These dollars were also extensively forged. Japan's 21 demands, in 1914, Japan captured the German colony at Kangdae. Then in January 1915, Japan sent a secret ultimatum, known as the 21 demands, to Beijing. Japan demanded an extension of extraterritoriality, the sale of businesses in debt to Japan, and cession of Kangdae to Japan. When these demands were made public, hostility within China was expressed in nationwide anti-Japanese demonstrations and an effective national boycott of Japanese goods. Yuan's eventual decision to agree to nearly all of the demands led to a decline in the popularity of Yuan's government among contemporary Chinese, although many of the requests were mere extensions of QING treaties. Western pressure later forced Japan to water down some of his demands. Revival of the monarchy, to build up his own authority, Yuan began to reinstitute elements of state Confucianism. As the main proponent of reviving QING state religious observances, Yuan effectively participated as emperor in rituals held at the QING Temple of Heaven. In late 1915, rumors were floated of a popular consensus that the monarchy should be revived. With his power secure, many of Yuan's supporters, notably monarchist Yang Du, advocated for a revival of the monarchy, asking Yuan to take on the title of emperor. Yang reasoned that the Chinese masses had long been used to autocratic rule, the republic had only been effective as a transitional phase to end Manchu rule, and China's political situation demanded the stability that only a monarchy could ensure. The American political scientist Frank Johnson Goodno suggested a similar idea. Negotiators representing Japan had also offered to support Yuan's ambitions as one of the rewards for Yuan's support of the 21 demands. In November 20, 1915, Yuan held a specially convened representative assembly, which voted unanimously to offer Yuan the throne. On December 12, 1915, Yuan accepted the invitation and proclaimed himself Emperor of the Chinese Empire under the era name of Hunxian. The new Empire of China was to formally begin on January 1, 1916, when Yuan, now the Hunxian Emperor, intended to conduct the accession rites. Soon after becoming emperor, the Hunxian emperor placed an order with the former imperial potters for a 40,000-piece porcelain set costing 1.4 million yuan, a large jade seal, and two imperial robes costing 400,000 yuan each. Public and international reactions to the monarchy's revival, the Hunxian emperor expected widespread domestic and international support for his reign. However, he and his supporters had badly miscalculated. Many of the emperor's closest supporters abandoned him, and the solidarity of the emperor's belayer and clique of military proto-copyright gar copyright s dissolved. There were open protests throughout China denouncing the Hunxian emperor. International governments, including Japan, proved suddenly indifferent or openly hostile to him, not giving him the recognition anticipated. Sun Yat-sen, who had fled to Tokyo and set up a base there, actively organized efforts to overthrow the Hunxian emperor. The emperor's sons publicly fought over the title of crown prince, and his former loyal subordinates like Duan Karui and Zhu Shishang left him to create their own factions. Abandonment of the monarchy and death Faced with widespread opposition, the Hunxian emperor repeatedly delayed the accession rights in order to appease his foes but his prestige was irreparably damaged and province after province continued to voice disapproval. On December 25, 1915, Yunnan's military governor, Kai Yi, rebelled, launching the National Protection War. The governor of Guizhou followed in January 1916, and Gangxi declared independence in March. Funding for the Hunxian emperor's accession ceremony was cut on March 1, and Yuan formally abandoned the empire on March 22 after 83 days. This was not enough for his enemies, who called for his resignation as president. More provinces rebelled until Yuan died from uremia at 10 a.m. on June 6, 1916, at the age of 56. Yuan's remains were moved to his home province and placed in a large mausoleum. In 1928, the tomb was looted by Feng Yuyang's Geminjin soldiers during the Northern Expedition. 
Yuan had a wife and nine concubines, who bore him seventeen sons, but only three were of any importance. These were, Prince Yuan Keding, who was handicapped and deemed an idiot by his father. Prince Yuan Qun, who was said by his father to be a fake scholar. And Prince Yuan Keliang, whom Yuan Shikai called a bandit. Evaluation and Legacy Historians in China have considered Yuan's rule mostly negatively. He introduced far-ranging modernizations in law and social areas, and trained and organized one of China's first modern armies. But the loyalty Yuan had fostered in the armed forces dissolved after his death, undermining the authority of the central government. Yuan financed his regime through large foreign loans, and is criticized for weakening Chinese morale and international prestige, and for allowing the Japanese to gain broad concessions over China. Jonathan Spence however, notes in his influential survey that Yuan was ambitious, both for his country and for himself, and that even as he subverted the constitution, paradoxically he sought to build on late QING attempts at reforms and to develop institutions that would bring strong and stable government to China. To gain foreign confidence and end the hated system of extraterritoriality, Yuan strengthened the court system and invited foreign advisers to reform the penal system. After Yuan's death, there was an effort by Li Yuanhong to revive the republic by recalling the legislators who had been ejected in 1913, but this effort was confused and ineffective in asserting central control. Li lacked any support from the military. There was a short-lived effort in 1917 to revive the Qing dynasty led by the loyalist general Jiang Zun, but his forces were defeated by rival warlords later that year. After the collapse of Jiang's movement, all pretense of strength from the central government collapsed, and China descended into a period of warlordism. Over the next several decades, the offices of both the president and parliament became the tools of militarists, and the politicians in Peking became dependent on regional governors for their support and political survival. After Yuan's death, China was left without any generally recognized central authority, and the nation's army quickly fragmented into forces of competing warlords. For this reason he is sometimes called the father of the warlords. However, it is not accurate to attribute China's subsequent age of warlordism as a personal preference, since in his career as a military reformer he had attempted to forge a modern army based on the Japanese model. Throughout his lifetime, he demonstrated an understanding of staffing, military education, and regular transfers of officer personnel, combining these skills to create China's first modern military organization. After his return to power in 1911, however, he seemed willing to sacrifice his legacy of military reform for imperial ambitions, and instead ruled by a combination of violence and bribery that destroyed the idealism of the early Republican movement. In the CCTV production Towards the Republic, Yuan is portrayed through most of his early years as an able administrator, although a very skilled manipulator of political situations. His self-proclamation as emperor is largely depicted as being influenced by external forces, especially that of his son, Prince Yuan Keding. A Xi with a steel in honor of Yuan Shikai, which was installed in Anyang's Hainuan Park soon after his death, was restored in 1993. Pseudonyms, like many Chinese men before 1949, Yuan used and was referred to by many different names. His courtesy name was Waiting and he used the pseudonym Rung. He was sometimes referred to by the name of his birthplace, Xian Peng, or by a title for tutors of the crown prince, Kung Pao. Personal information, paternal grandfather, Yuan Shusen. Father, Yuan Barazhong, courtesy name Shukan. Uncle, Yuan Baniking, courtesy name Duchen, pseudonym Yanzi, Yuan Barazhong's younger brother. Wife, Yuai Sheng. Daughter of Yuo, a wealthy man from Shinkayu County, Henan. Married Yuan Shikai in 1876. Mother of Yuan Keding. Concubines, Lady Shen, previously a courtesan from Shitso, Lady Li, of Korean origin. Mother of Yuan Bozen, Yuan Kekwan, Yuan Keki, Yuan Kejin, and Yuan Kedu, Lady Kim, of Korean origin. Mother of Yuan Kyun, Yuan Keliang, Yuan Shuzhen, Yuan Huanshen, and Yuan Sizhen, Lady O, of Korean origin. 
mother of Yuan Kejuan, Yuan Tsungzen, Yuan Sizhen, and Yuan Fuzhen, Lady Yang, mother of Yuan Qihuan, Yuan Kezhen, Yuan Kejiu, Yuan Qian, Yuan Jishen, and Yuan Lingzhen, Lady Yi, previously a prostitute in Nanjing. Mother of Yuan Keji, Yuan Qiao, Yuan Fuzhen, Yuan Kizhen, and Yuan Ruizhen, Lady Zhang, originally from Henan, Lady Guo, originally a prostitute from Shitso. Mother of Yuan Kexiang, Yuan Qi, and Yuan Huzhen, Lady Liu, originally a maid to Yuan Shikai's fifth concubine Lady Yang. Mother of Yuan Kefan and Yuan Ishen. Sons, Yuan Keding, courtesy name Yuntai, Yuan Qun, courtesy name Borsen, Yuan Keliang, married a daughter of Zhang Baixi, Yuan Kejuan, married He Shenji, Yuan Kekuan, courtesy name Guan, pseudonym Baina, married a daughter of Totek Duanfang, Yuan Ki Huan, married Chen Zheng, Yuan Keki, married a daughter of Somboki, Yuan Kezen, married Zoruitsu, Yuan Kejiu, married Li Xiaofang in 1934, Yuan Kejin, married a daughter of Lu Jian's Hang, Yuan Qian, married Li Banyui, Yuan Keidu, married a daughter of the wealthy Luo Yun's Hang, Yuan Kexiang, married firstly Zhang Shufang, married secondly Chen Sixing, Yuan Keji, married Lady Wang, Yuan Qi, married a daughter of Zhang Dianakan, Yuan Kefan, died young, Yuan Qiao, married a daughter of Yu Yunpeng. Famous grandsons and great grandsons, Yuan's grandson, Liu Kaiyan Liu Yuan was a Chinese American physicist. Yuan's great grandson, Li Young Li, is an Indonesian born Chinese American writer and poet. See also References Equals Citations Equals Equals Sources Equals Further reading McKinnon, Stephen A Power and Politics in Late Imperial China, Yuan Shikai in Beijing and Tianjin, 1901 08. University of California Press. ISBN 0520040252. External links. Early support for Yuan among overseas Chinese. The Fight for the Republic in China by Bertram Lennox Simpson at Project Gutenberg. This e text, first published in 1917, contains a detailed account of Yuan Shikai, his rise and fall. Map of Yuan's Mausoleum. Media related to Yuan Shikai at Wikimedia Commons.